We do have a very special thing happening in this service. For the first time, I believe, uh, officially, we get to have the new um, Barut couple is... Um, it's having a wonderful impact in ministry already. Uh, we're so glad to see them back safely from their honeymoon, and um, they're going to come forward and read our scripture from Paul's letter to the Corinthians. Reading from 1 Corinthians 15, 1 through 11. Let me now remind you, dear brothers and sisters, of the good news I preached to you before. You welcomed it then, and you still stand firm in it. It is this good news that saves you if you continue to believe the message I told you, unless, of course, you believe something that was never true in the first place. I passed on to you what was most important, and what had also been passed on to me. Christ died for our sins, just as the scriptures said. He was buried, and he was raised from the dead, and on the third day, just as the scriptures said, he was seen by Peter, and then by the twelve. After that, he was seen by more than 500 of his followers at one time, most of whom are still alive, though some have died. Then he was seen by James, and later by all the apostles. Last of all, as though I had been born at the wrong time, I also saw him. For I am the least of all the apostles. In fact, I'm not even worthy to be called an apostle after the way I persecuted God's church. But whatever I am now, it is all because God poured out his special favor on me, and not without results. For I have worked harder than any of the other apostles, yet it was not I, but God who was working through me by his grace." So it makes no difference whether I preach or they preach, for we all preach the same message. You have already believed. When I was a four-year-old, maybe five, but my family always tells this story as if I was four years old. So we're going to go with four-year-old David. That takes us, we're going to go in our time machine. Everybody, let's pile in ready. Get into your TARDIS or whatever time machine we're going in. Buckle up because we're going back to the year 1993. Feels like yesterday, doesn't it? I was in the car with my aunt. I was a precocious child. Maybe you have an experience of being a precocious child when you were young. Doesn't matter. Uh, needless to say, I was, and we were listening to a Christian radio station, and I remember hearing on the radio station, today is Good Friday. We have the opportunity to celebrate and to remember Jesus' death. And, of course, when the radio goes off, I start a discussion with my aunt, and, and I say to her, did you know, Auntie? And she says, what is that, David? And she knew that I was about to take her on a journey. And I said, did you know that originally... They call it Good Friday now, and it doesn't make a lot of sense, because what's good about Jesus dying? But originally, they were going to call it Goodbye Friday, and then they shortened it because it was easier. Now, that's not the reality, and over the course of many years, I've checked. You know, I, I went to a Christian school, and I, I asked, you know, is the reason we call it Good Friday because it was goodbye to Jesus? And, and of course, that, that doesn't make any sense, because was Goodbye Friday the goodbye to Jesus? No, it wasn't like, there you go, see you later, Jesus, that was nice knowing you. Doesn't make sense. Now, in other cultures, I have an opportunity in, in a class I'm taking right now, I'm reading a lot of German pietists, and you can say, what is a German pietist? We won't talk about it, we won't get into it, you don't need to know. However, the Germans didn't call it Good Friday, they called it Sorrowful Friday. Does that make a little more sense, that we come together for a service of Sorrowful Friday, but still... Hmm, sorrowful, I, I, I can see why, but still there are things good about it. So then another debunked tale is that it's called Good Friday because it was actually God Friday. And of course, that is one of those internet rumors, kind of like the internet rumor uh, when they changed Blue's Clues characters and they said that something horrible happened to Steve. 
totally false. I watched the new Blue's Clues movie with all three of the, of the Friends of Blue with my children. Nothing bad happened to Steve. And that whole thing of Good Friday being God Friday, it has nothing to do with anything. The most likely origin is actually good means holy. Good is the standard of goodness, God's goodness, not our relativistic, confusing human like this pizza that I'm eating is kind of good, but the mac and cheese is not, but God's standard for good. And so we can think of it as Holy Friday. So I welcome you here in this Holy Friday service as we celebrate um, the passion of Jesus together. And you can say, David, why are we celebrating it? Well, there's a lot to celebrate. Because we are not a people who live without the hope of the resurrection. We actually live with the resurrection of Jesus being in the past tense. So it's impossible to separate the two. We cannot sit here all gloomy and sad and say, well, Jesus is dead and that's it. That doesn't make any sense. We live in the tension of, yes, we're celebrating the passion of, of Jesus. We're remembering that. We're acknowledging how difficult it was. We're acknowledging all the struggles and, and the sweating blood, of course, and all these different experiences of Jesus on that Thursday and Friday, of course. But we do live not only the hope of resurrection, but the reality of resurrection. Jesus is alive. It's not just like at Easter when we say, He is risen, He is risen indeed, that we get to say that. We can say that tonight, too. We have to look at all of that. That's why we're going to look at this text in a moment. But we have a problem, and this is a problem that we're starting to really face as Christians, and I want to throw this graphic up. We have a problem that if we have faith in something other than the biblical Jesus, it's not real faith. If I have faith that I can make it, if I have faith in my works, is that going to do anything for me? If I have faith that I look at something like the Bible and I say, well, the Bible saves me, is that going to be any helpful? It's not the Bible who saves me, it's it's Jesus as we see in the Bible, as depicted there. And the problem is, is that for many, many, many years, we've done this thing called deconstruction. And we've looked and we've said, oh, there's all sorts of problems with what we're dealing with. So we're just going to, we're going to make Jesus something we're more comfortable with. So a very wonderful person in American history was a guy named Thomas Jefferson. Have we ever heard of him? Thomas Jefferson wrote the Declaration of Independence. Did you also know that he has a version of the Bible that there were things he was not comfortable with, and so he literally took a razor blade and cut it out until he was ready to say, I'm comfortable with this. The problem is, is that so often as Christians, we can do the same thing with Jesus. We can do the same thing where there's certain things that we really like. We love the Beatitudes. We love the greatest commandment. We love the golden rule. We love his charitable acts to the poor, and we love, of course, when he goes in and knocks over the temple, right? All the money changers. We love these things, but we have a hard time with some of those other things, and so sometimes we can put them on the back burner. This wasn't just a problem for Thomas Jefferson. This has happened over and over and over with different theologians and philosophers and scholars and pop culture and the internet. Watch this. So in the early 20th century... You had a theologian and philosopher named Albert Schweitzer, and he basically said he was on a quest to discover the real Jesus, the historical Jesus, and he ultimately decided that, and here's his most famous quote, he comes to us as one unknown. And so the problem with that is ultimately, when we take some of those ideas about Jesus, it starts to be, I look in the mirror and I see the version of Jesus I want to see. But that gets really problematic very quickly because look at this. It gets even weirder in the internet age because then we get articles like this. Like it or not, and I'm picking on all sides, Jesus was a liberal because if I look in the mirror and see Jesus myself, if I'm progressive, I do that. Of course, got to pick on the other side. Here's an article called Jesus the Conservative. You can read these. Here's one called Opinion. Jesus is a communist. Jesus the Libertarian. You can read all these articles. I like this one. Jesus Christ the Anarchist. 
And finally, Jesus was a socialist. Now, the challenge is, is that I think we can all agree that neither of those is the, tr the true biblical Jesus. None of those is. The true biblical Jesus is described here in this letter to the Corinthians. And we get really wonky when we try to say, I'm comfortable with these things, so I want to see Jesus as liking this political party or this ideology or this sports team. We can get in trouble very quickly, and we can, we can start to create our own Jesus. And I want to talk about the book of the letter of 1 Corinthians. So the Apostle Paul, this, is, this letter was written before the Gospels were written, and he's helped plant this church. He spent about a year and a half in Corinth helping plant the church, and then he moves on, and he's writing back because he's hearing they're having a lot of issues, and one of the issues is they're all overthinking Jesus. They're getting away from, now, of course, the biblical Jesus doesn't fully exist yet because the Bible isn't fully written, but they're getting away from any sort of real Jesus, and they're saying, well, maybe he didn't actually raise from the dead. Maybe he didn't actually die. Maybe this, maybe that. And they're having all these different debates, and they're having all these different problems. They're having problems about how they gather together. They're having problems about what sort of standards they have, and they're having problems talking about who is Jesus, what did he actually do. And so if we look at this, you're going to see that Paul uses a phrase which I really like, and I think we can really like it too. It's this idea of first importance. He says the gospel is of first importance. And I also use this phrase where I say first things first. This idea of, as we put it on the screen, this idea of first importance. So first importance is basically... Yes, we like other things about Jesus. We love that he cares for the poor. We love that he challenges hypocrisy. We love all these other things. But we got to start with the gospel message. We got to start with the fact that we say Jesus actually died for our sins. We start with the fact that this happened in accordance with Scripture. We start with the fact that he was actually buried, that he was, he was actually dead in the ground. We start with the fact that he rose after three days and he then appeared to many eyewitnesses. Sometimes we have a really short, big idea, so you can write it down, put it on a bumper sticker, and then you got the sermon in one thing. It's harder to take this and boil it down because the reality is, is if we're going to understand truly the biblical Jesus, we want to take the Apostle Paul here and we want to say, this is what I can understand. Jesus actually died for our sins in accordance with Scripture, was buried rose after three days, and appeared to many eyewitnesses. And we're going to talk through this tonight, because as we have this opportunity to look back and to appreciate and to celebrate Good Friday and to acknowledge the difficulty and acknowledge the agony, we have to break this down to look at the various parts. Let's start with the first. Jesus actually died because of our sin. The text says this, Christ died for our sins. Now, we can take that and say, yeah, no-brainer, David, I, I, I get that. Well, what does that actually mean? And we're going to look at five real quick parts. We're not going to go long on each part. We're going to look boom, boom, boom to break it down. Christ died for our sin. Here comes your theology. I'm going to put three big words up here. Substitutionary penal atonement. Say this with me. Substitutionary penal atonement. Here's how we understand it. Substitutionary is, have you ever had a substitute teacher? Yeah, in place of, right? Penal, what is penal for punishment, right? So, so, so a penal colony is a, is a place where you work off a of punishment. There's the penal system, the, the system that orchestrates punishment. Okay, we get that. So substitutionary in place of, or we have this, Jesus came, lived perfectly, and died in our place. That's what substitutionary means. It means that humans are sinful. Humans do things where we miss the mark. Humans don't get it perfect. Anybody here get it perfect? We don't get it perfect. So that has a cost. Sin is not free. Has anyone ever taken a charge card that you borrowed or stole and you charged up a whole bunch of charges and just said, well, I don't have to pay for it? Someone still had to pay the bill, right? That's, we can kind of think of it like that. Kind of think of it as grabbing mommy or daddy's credit card and doing all sorts of swipes. There's a, a debt aid, a debt, a debt owed. 
and we still have to figure that out. But substitutionary is saying Jesus came, lived perfectly, and died in our place. Penal is the punishment. Now, in the situation of the credit card, what's the punishment? Paying the bill, right? And we always get the thing of, have you ever seen the TV show or movie where they, they get the free lunch, they steal the lunch, and then they have to work it off in the dish pit? So it's kind of like that idea. A bit worse. Not that rosy and not that fluffy. Jesus took on the full punishment we deserve. That is what we see on Good Friday. We have the cross draped black. When you came in, you saw last words of Jesus. Did you see the various last words of Jesus? Some of us went up and we had the opportunity to go to a friend of mine's church, um, Pastor Seth, and he had a Via Dolorosa where we got to see all these different parts of this journey where we see where Jesus is whipped and we see where he has to carry this really heavy cross. There's all sorts of punishment. We don't need to get into the punishment. We need to acknowledge the punishment. And then atonement is literally with the price paid, sin is wiped away. Atonement is wiping clean. It's wiping clean the debt. So substitutionary, penal atonement, this is what it means that Jesus actually died for our sins. It's not that he actually died and magically, I'm not sure how, it's going to be better. It's that literally, in our place, Jesus came, lived perfectly, died. Jesus took on the full punishment we deserved, and now with the price paid, sin is wiped away when we do what? When we believe, when we have faith. So, not to continue down too much, it's kind of like, has anyone ever gotten into an at-fault car accident, and you smashed up somebody else's car. There's a price that has to be paid. And so we see that with Jesus. Okay, so we start there, and we got to start with that, but then we got to go to this next line. So yes, Jesus actually died because of our sin. Also, Scripture can be trusted. Scripture can be trusted. Here's what it says, in accordance with the Scriptures. What are the Scriptures? The Scriptures were written over about a 1,500 year period of time. We start with the book of Genesis, and we go all the way to the book of Revelation. And some of the earliest words in Genesis, in fact, the Bible begins with, in the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. And we see this unfolding story. We've talked about how it's one story, about how it's God's redemptive history pursuing us, loving us, reconciling, all the way to the new heavens and the new earth that hasn't happened yet. We see that Scripture can be trusted. You know, you say, I don't totally get all the stuff that happens on Good Friday. Why did that need to happen? That seems a little unnecessary. Does anyone ever look at that and say, you know, I just don't get why Jesus had to go on a human cross and die. That, that, that's confusing. We've all struggled with things like this and questions like this. But if we look back in the redemptive history, the mission of God that's documented in Scripture, we very clearly see why this had to happen and that this would happen. We have all these wonderful glimpses in almost every single book of the Bible. You're able to see things where either God is actively working to redeem or restoration is being promised. You see things like the suffering servant passage in Isaiah. You see this promise made to David that even though things aren't going to be perfect, eventually the kingly line of David will be completed. We have all these wonderful things, and when we take the entire book, you'll see that the promises that are in Scripture don't contradict each other. They all reveal this one wonderful master plan that starts to be unfolded. Now, but you can say, I have a hard time trusting. Anybody, you don't have to put your hand up, but anybody have a hard time trusting? Because if I have a hard time trusting anything, trusting that Scripture contains everything necessary for salvation and the right depiction of Jesus, because at the beginning, we said one of the problems is if we move away from the biblical Jesus, that we're having faith in the wrong thing. But you can say to me, David, I have a hard time trusting that they must have gotten it wrong. There must have been there must have been some sort of major error that happened. There must have been some sort of thing that got, went horribly awry. And so, yeah, now you got this book, but there's a lot of problems. Well, I won't go into details too much, but the reality is, is that the more texts we discover, the more harmony of all the different texts we see. 
Imagine that you died today and you left a journal, and it was found 2,000 years later. How many copies of that, that journal would there be? Do we only have one old copy of Scripture? No, we have thousands of copies of the various scriptures in multiple languages, and scholars have literally taken them together. And one of the questions people say is, well, there's a lot of contradiction in those, right? Well, no. The majority of times that we see anything different in scripture is usually because someone who was um, the scribe maybe misspelled something or put two eyes or maybe just put words in a wrong order. The majority of errors in those original texts that we have are very, very minimal and little to none affect meaning at all. But you can still say, I live in the context of the boy who cried wolf. Who remembers the story of the boy who cried wolf? Okay. The boy who cried wolf, if you remember, and if you don't, that's okay. I don't know if my kids know this story, and I don't know if I'll teach it to them. This is one of those weird stories that maybe didn't age well. Doesn't the boy get eaten in this story? I think he does. Let's go for it. Little boy is outside playing, and his parents are inside, hanging out, cooking dinner, doing everything they need to do, and he says, there's a wolf. What happens? Parents run out. Is there a wolf? No wolf. Oh, good. You're safe. Oh, we love you. Hey, buddy, uh, you know... We're going to make him David. David, uh, please, just like only say wolf if there's an actually a wolf. Can we agree to that? Oh, of course. I'm so sorry. Next day, wolf comes out. Is there a wolf? This happens 19 more times. What happens on the 19th time? Boy gets eaten by a real wolf, and the parents are like, I wish we would have known, but they couldn't trust. And so the problem is, is we live sometimes in this context of, I have a hard time trusting People are playing these games with truth on all sides of political aisles and discussions, and I don't feel like I can trust. Well, I will tell you, this is something where you can pray, and you can say, you know, Lord, I have some trust issues, but I know that Scripture can be trusted. It's hard for me to get there. Lord, would you work in my heart and allow me to be softened a little bit and to, before I make a decision, if I really feel like I can't trust Scripture... Lord, would you work in my heart and allow me to get to know Scripture first? And maybe if I'm really skeptical, maybe I'll go back and read about some of those councils that put together the various Scriptures, and then I'll make a decision. But Lord, I'm going to start with faith. I'm going to start and say, you know what? I'm going to trust. Scripture can be trusted. I'm going to give it a shot, and I'm going to see how you'll change my life with that understanding. So Scripture can be trusted. But also, Jesus' dead, lifeless body was buried. And I'm sorry for that sounding a little coarse, but we got to talk about that, right? If I look at this whole gospel message, the good news, the good news, right? We talked about the substitutionary penal atonement. So we talked about this idea that if we essentially say, Jesus came, lived perfectly, died in our place, took on the full punishment with the price now paid, sins wiped away, that means that Jesus physically died. And if you read the gospel story and you read the Passion, you will see that between the 12 o'clock hour and the 3 o'clock hour, there is silence for three hours. And then Jesus cries out, breathes his last, and dies. And then they take his body, and the other two people that are crucified with him, they break their legs. They don't break Jesus' legs, and you can say, why not? Well, remember how I said Scripture can be trusted? Because literally in the Old Testament, it talks about how his legs are not going to be broken. Literally, all the things that are predicted actually come true through Jesus. Jesus is the total fulfillment of all the Old Testament promises. But nonetheless, Jesus had a dead, lifeless body. And two secret disciples, we read about this in John's Gospel, you have this guy, Joseph of Arimathea, has a brand new tomb. He probably did a full car payment for it, maybe a mortgage payment. Beautiful brand new tomb. And he says, hey, let's, let's get the body, let's clean the body, and let's put that in the tomb. And another secret disciple, for God so loved the world. You remember that John 3.16, the Nicodemus guy? We miss this, by the way. We miss that he shows up here in John's gospel. Nicodemus comes... And he's the guy who starts off as a skeptic. Remember how I said you might be in a place where you say, I don't know if I can trust Scripture. I've been kind of lied to a lot. I have a hard time trusting. Well, there's this guy, Nicodemus. He did too. 
And he says, what does it mean to be born again? And they have this whole interchange. You can read it in John 3. And it goes back and forth and back and forth. But somehow we see that a little bit later in John's gospel, he comes a, becomes a witness. And then by the time the end of the gospel, he's actually a secret disciple of Jesus and he helps along with the ladies have the body be buried. And we see that these all happen, and these are realities. These aren't stories. These are historical realities. And these matter in our lives. Jesus had a dead, lifeless body. And now, death can be hard to talk about. Because we look at it and we say, you know what, David, you've said Jesus' dead, lifeless body so many times, that feels really uncomfortable. We don't like talking about that. We don't go take field trips to morgues to hang out there. That's not a pleasant, comfortable thing. We don't like when we go to a wake and we spend a bunch of time with the, the deceased with the open coffin. We maybe pay our respects, pray for a moment, and go look at the pictures because death is uncomfortable. Can we agree? But I think of my uncle passed away from a disease, from, from a type of cancer, when he was in his late 60s. And he was a devout Christian. And my aunt, his wife, is a devout Christian, and she was asked this weird question, was it a good death? Isn't that an odd question to ask someone? And here's what she said, death is not good. I lost my husband. It was bad because it was death. So just because we live in hope of resurrection, the reality of resurrection, that doesn't mean that we celebrate Good Friday, and say, oh, it wasn't painful for Jesus. Oh, it wasn't difficult for Jesus. Oh, he didn't take on our guilt and our shame and all these things. No, it was. Jesus actually died. Death is not good. Death is bad because it's death. And Jesus experienced that for us and did that for us. Remember, substitutionary penal atonement. But it didn't end there, right? Because as the Apostle Paul says... Jesus physically rose from the dead. We heard Karen and Dave read, he was raised on the third day in accordance with the Scriptures. Now you're once again seeing a phrase that we talked about before, in accordance with the Scriptures. Do you see how this is so important? This isn't random. Jesus isn't randomly being carried away and we have to explain it away. No, if you take the Bible and you look at it, it actually promises that this will happen. And while it will seem negative, this will be a good thing. Much good will come out of it. He's raised on the third day. And what, what do we need to talk about with that? How about a giant 500-pound stone? It was rolled away. How about the fact that you had a guy named Thomas who touched his hands? Because sometimes people can wonder, maybe you've wondered this. I've wondered this. So we all wonder about resurrection bodies. If you've really been a Christian or you've thought about any of this, maybe you've said, did Jesus actually raise from the dead or was it just kind of a supernatural spiritual thing? Don't raise hands, but if you wonder this, something we wonder. Well, there's evidence right in Scripture that tells us that Jesus physically rose. There was an empty tomb. There was a rolled away stone. There was people who physically touched him. And we're going to get into it a little bit more because, look, it goes right here that eyewitnesses verified it all. You can say, David, I, I don't believe that. Well, eyewitnesses literally verified it all. Because what it says is in 1 Corinthians 15, yeah, he was seen by Peter and by the 12. After that, he was seen by more than 500 of his followers at one time, most of whom are still alive at the time of writing though some have died. Then he was seen by James and later by all the apostles. Last of all, and this is the Apostle Paul writing, as though I had been born at the wrong time, I also saw him. So who are these people? Because you can say, you know, I'm skeptical about this. Really? 500 people? Well, let's, let's look what Scripture says. So Cephas is Simon Peter. We see many interactions of Jesus and Simon Peter in the resurrection, Certainly John 21, you can mark that down. The 12, again, we see a lot of interactions between Jesus and the 12 disciples. John 20 has that. What about 500 brothers at one time? Well, this is alluded to in Mark 16. What about James? That's the brother of Jesus. James, the brother of Jesus, literally becomes a key leader in the Jerusalem church 
leads the church for a 20-year period, and we get the epistle of James, which is a collection of wisdom that he was inspired by Jesus' words and by the Old Testament book of Proverbs. What about all the apostles? Where are my Emmaus people at? My Emmaus people always come to this, so I always give you a shout-out. The whole Emmaus experience, right? Okay, enough said. My Emmaus people, I love you guys. Okay, all the apostles, Luke 24 with Emmaus. He also appeared to me, that's the apostle Paul says that, in Acts 9 on road to Damascus. Now you can say, David, again, I'm skeptical. I'm not convinced. Here's kind of the most powerful thing that we can get about this because our big idea is that Jesus actually died for our sins in accordance with Scripture, was buried, rose after three days, and appeared to many eyewitnesses. Says who? Well, it says recorded in Scripture. And do you remember the behavior of all the disciples around the time of Good Friday? Where'd they go? See you, Jesus. I'm out of here. I'm going to go get pizza. I'm going to go hide. I'm going to go in a little cave, right? But then after he's resurrected, what happens to the majority of them? They're willing to die for him, and most of them are martyred in really awful ways that I promise you I'm, I'm not going to do that thing where I'm going to say, I'm not going to talk about it, and then I do. I'm not going to talk about it, but it's gory and a lot, and you can read about it, and you should. It says right there in Scripture, it also gives us in some of our, oh, non-scriptural historical documents of that time period, it starts to document the death of some of these people. Eyewitnesses verified it all, and they started off afraid, scared, running away. And once they saw this, it was real, and it changed them, and they were willing to actually die for it. Now, that brings us to our big idea. Jesus actually died for our sins. It's real. Substitutionary penal atonement is the idea. You're now a scholar, but it's real. In accordance with Scripture, Scripture is one story leading to this. And does Scripture end here? No, we continue now with the birth of the church. If you're joining us either on the live stream, watching this later, or here with us in worship, you're part of that movement of the church, the ecclesia, the called out people of God. In accordance with Scripture, that happened. We see that start in Acts and continue to today. Was buried rose after three days, appeared to many eyewitnesses. And so sometimes we do a thing where we have you come forward. We're not going to do that tonight. The band's going to come up in a moment. We're going to sing a song that you may say, that doesn't make a lot of sense on Good Friday. We don't just live with Good Friday. We remember Good Friday, but we live with the reality of the resurrection of Jesus. The truth is Jesus is alive. He rose from the dead. The truth of the gospel changes us. Because look at this. When we accept the gospel, we start to realize that God's power over death teaches us about other stuff too. This is not the first things first. We started with the first things first of the gospel message. Here's the other ancillary benefits. That scary thing that I have a hard time facing would be like nothing compared to having to carry a huge splintery wooden cross after being beaten almost to death. That's nothing. That's nothing. We can do that. That horrible boss that abuses power and we just wish was fired is nothing compared to Pontius Pilate. I'm sorry. Pontius Pilate was a mass murderer for an evil regime historically, right? It means things like failure and death are just part of the process. If God is able to use something so horrible as our Savior being nailed on the cross, what can he do with the less horrible, difficult things we go through? But, but that's not the first things first. Again, if we just make the gospel message all about the benefits, we lose it. That's why tonight we gather, and I use the word celebrate, we celebrate the biblical Jesus. We are appreciative that Jesus actually died for our sins. That makes a difference. We no longer have to just, we can choose to. If I just say, hey, Jesus, you died, but you know, I got it, I'm all set. You have a good time and I'm gonna go over here. Then I'm not freed from the power and guilt of my sin. And all of us, even if we 
received Jesus as a child and it's been 50 years or 20 years, it doesn't matter. If we walk away, that's not helpful. And we can turn back and we can say, hey, Lord, I repent. I, I move away from my sin. I should have followed you. I want to follow you. Let's continue that journey together. We started it. I want to be part of that. Jesus actually died for our sins in accordance with Scripture, was buried, rose after three days, appeared to many eyewitnesses. And that is the reality that we live in. And so we have this choice. It can either change us or not. It's like a gift. If you have a gift under your Christmas tree and it forever stays unopened, it doesn't do you any good. If you have a wonderful gift that you opened and liked and played with it once and don't ever use it, it doesn't do us any good. I'm not trivializing. I'm not saying that that is what the gospel is. But what I'm saying is we have the opportunity to say yes to Jesus today, to say, wow, I appreciate it. We're going to throw up our big idea. We're going to say this together, and then we're going to sing, because this is what I appreciate, God. <laughs> Jesus actually died for our sins in accordance with Scripture, was buried, rose after three days, and appeared to many eyewitnesses. Let's stand and sing. <laughs>